Good afternoon, and welcome to the Voices and Leadership series. This series focuses on the nexus of science and leadership to create positive change in the world of public health. I am Betty Johnson, and I have the privilege to direct this program and to introduce our speaker today. Our guest today has a personality as dynamic as the company she leads. After graduating from the University of Akele Daenerys Medical School in Madrid, Spain, Dr. Belen Garillo worked as a practicing physician for six years before joining the pharmaceutical industry in 1989. She subsequently specialized in clinical pharmacology at University Hospital La Paz, uh, University Autonoma in Madrid, Spain. She thinks of the transition from being a physician to being the CEO of a large corporation as still serving patients, but from a different place. Dr. Gurillo looks at business in the same way as she used to look at her patients. She recognizes the symptoms and goes to the root cause and then treats the problem. Her approach to her medical practice could also describe her practice of leadership, direct, transformative, and impactful. A 25-year-plus industry veteran, Dr. Grillo joined Merck KGAA in Darmstadt, Germany as Chief Operating Officer in 2011. However, just two years later, she was named President and CEO of Merck Serono, the biopharma division of Merck KGAA in Germany, an unprecedented move by the $6 billion entity. Despite having more than 15,000 employees and operating in 66 countries, no woman had ever held this high position of leadership within Merck KGAA, the world's oldest pharmaceutical and chemical company. Dr. Gurillo is the first and only woman to head a top 25 pharma pharmaceutical company which markets drugs focusing on fertility, cancer, and multiple sclerosis. Her vision as a leader has significantly transformed Merck Healthcare. Before I turn this session over to Dr. Meredith Rosenthal, Professor of Health Economics in the Department of Health Policy and Management and Associate Dean for Diversity, who will conduct today's interview, please join me as we welcome Dr. Belene Guerrero to the Voices and Leadership Series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you, Betty. And uh, thank you, Dr. Garijo, if I may call you Belen. Please. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so your career has taken you around the world. Uh, you've had positions in many different countries. And as we just heard, you have employees in 66 countries and patients, if I may call them that, everywhere. Uh, so, uh, so can you tell me a little bit about how you think about leading a company that is so global in nature and, and what's essential for a leader to interact with people from different cultures in different contexts? Right. Let me speak a little bit about global leadership because uh, uh, leading globally is actually uh, a, a new mindset. In the past, and, and this is particularly true for this industry because in the past, we thought leading globally was being successful in the U.S. and Europe. Today, uh, uh, being a successful global leader requires that you succeed uh, in the U.S., in Europe, but also that you capture the growth of, of new markets, emerging markets. And this has represented a, a very significant uh, leadership transformation for our industry and, and in particular for our company, which in the last four years became uh, uh, a true global leader in certain disease areas. Um, what is absolutely imperative to, uh, to operate effectively on a global scale is uh, first embracing diversity. Uh, and, and you know, everything starts by having the right team. This is what I believe is, uh, is um, you know, has marked my experience. Having the right talent in the organization uh, and having a diverse executive team has been absolutely key uh, in our transformation process to become a, a global leader. So uh, diversity uh, is, uh, is very much at the center of uh, the way we operate globally. Uh, and obviously during the last four years we have come from being a uh, a very Europe-centric company to uh, to being um, um, 
to operating successfully on a global scale through a diverse team that is uh, uh, very talented and understands uh, how to implement our global strategy and when do we have to be, when and how do we have to operate globally, you know, uh, limited flexibility uh, to change and transform what our global teams are, um, um, let's say, designing and when do we have to operate regionally because the circumstances of our, of our portfolio and uh, um, and our strategy requires us to do so. So, is 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 finding this uh, um, evolution towards becoming a diverse, um, more flexible and at the same time more disciplined company, which is going to be poised to succeed in those emblematic markets that we have mentioned before: U.S., Europe, and and other developed markets, but also capturing the, the, the growth and the opportunity of China, India, and other markets that today are contributing very, very uh, importantly to our growth. You mentioned the importance of developing talent. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about, how, first, how do you identify the people who are going to be the next generation of leaders in your company? And then, you know, what combination of giving them free reign versus giving them uh, guidance and training do you think is necessary to bring those people along to, um, to their full potential? Well, I, you know, uh I believe, and I have been advocating for this in my own company, that uh, the best way to develop people is on the job. Obviously, uh, giving people opportunities to be trained and to accelerate the development is is uh, is important. But uh, you know, when you see a talented individual in the organization, you really uh, put you know throw him to the pool, mm -hmm. and um, you hope. Uh, the person will really find a way to swim <laughs> successfully <laughs> till the next storm, you know, and, and this happens, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is uh, developing people in the job is something that I have experienced very successfully uh, during my 25 years of career, starting by myself, <laughs> if I may say so, uh, who came to the industry 25 years ago directly from, uh, from the clinic. So um, what do we value? On, on, on obviously, you know, companies like our company will have uh, a very well established talent development process. But at the same time, what I care about is that my senior leaders will embrace talent. And talent uh, is very, 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 uh, is going very well together with diversity. So we have, as many other companies, a, a very serious talent development process that will allow us to to spot, uh, develop, and help people grow in our company. But uh, we want to have uh, people who are really uh, the owners of their own careers. Mm -hmm. So we, I think the biggest role that a senior executive we can play is, is to make them aware that they have to be the owner, and by being the owner, they have to understand what they want to do. They have to be very actively voicing what they want to do, and, and they have to have a roadmap that is going to be agreed with their, their supervisors to, 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 to get there. So we, we value energy, uh, uh, we value um, learning agility, obviously, we value productivity, we, we value determination. Uh, we value people who wants to make things happen, mm -hmm. you know, who understand what is the difference between performance and, and lack of performance. People who are driving and uh, fighting for success in a very highly competitive world, which is the pharma industry in those days. Mm -hmm. I, I, you um, uh, left me wanting to know more about <laughs> some of your own experiences in developing your own leadership, uh, and uh, you, I got the implication that uh, that you were forged in being thrown into some pool and learning how to swim. So, 
when you think of some of these these key moments in your own career, um, you know, how do you know when this is a this is a key moment? And um, and as a leader, how do you think about making these really challenging decisions uh, at that point? So you know, maybe use a specific example if you might. If you can name names. I think, yeah, I, I can speak a little bit about this. <laughs> well, actually, I have to say I threw myself into the pool. So at some point, I didn't have to be pushed. <laughs> but, uh, uh, make, you know, let's just spend a little bit of time on the, on the area of making decisions because uh, obviously making decisions is, is innate to a leader. You have to make decisions. And you are going to be asked to make decisions every other minute of the day. So you have to make decisions first at the right time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and this is not always when the organization expects that you make a decision. Um, and, and at the end, making decision is a combination of having the facts, having, having heard your teams, giving you the facts, and having your own uh, understanding of what are the facts, but also using your hunch. You know, sometimes I'm confronted with perfect facts, but something is, is really bothering me uh, uh, on my stomach. And, and let me tell you, I really pay as much attention to that as necessary. What do I do then? You know, I try to further explore. I, I spend a little bit more time contrasting my views with others. I look for someone who may have expertise. Um, make, you know, you can make a, a decision on the spot. When you, uh, this is probably not going to be on people decisions or, may, or, or decisions with financial, significant financial implications or uh, when you are in front of major risk. But having this right balance between facts and hunch is what I believe is most important when you have to make a decision, any decision. Uh, that you remind me, uh, I've heard people say that you, you know you're leading when you can feel it in your stomach. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, sp speaking of self-awareness and leadership, uh, we hear a lot about the importance of authentic leadership style. And I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on, on how you figured out what, what your authentic leadership style was and, uh, and how, how you describe yourself as a leader. Yeah. Um. Look, something that I believe is super important for a leader is to be credible, okay? And you cannot be credible if you are not authentic, if people uh, do not believe in you, uh, if you haven't been able to develop trust, if you are not able to look at someone, um, you know, eye-to-eye -eye contact and, and, and give good news and bad news transparently, uh, respectfully, and, uh, uh, you know, and, and very openly. So I give tremendous importance to uh, uh, authentic leadership because this is the only way you can be credible to the organization. Okay, the day when I lose credibility, I am dead. I will not be able to succeed as a leader uh, because, you know, no matter how strong my vision is or how effective my strategy is, nobody will embrace it. So a leader is someone that's, that others will follow, right? So um, if I'm not credible, how can I be successful? And this is very, very important because our executive life is confronting us with different styles, uh, different expectations, uh, different cultures. And, and, and you know, this is uh, why you have to be uh, a bit chameleonic without losing credibility, adapt yourself to the different style and meet people's expectation. I think that, uh, you know, if I, if I would be using exactly the same communication style and leadership style with each and every employee of my, of my company, I would definitely fail. So uh, authenticity is, is super important and, and is a consequence of self-awareness. When you are in a position of power, um, people look at you and, and, and you know, you have to be aware of the impact that you make. You cannot be intimidating. Uh, you cannot be uh, crossing certain barriers because, you know, you can get the opposite effect, which is you can paralyze more rather than engage. Uh, so if you want to engage and make sure the organization understands where you are coming from, for someone like me with a very strong Southern European character, <laughs> you, <laughs> 
you have to make sure that you smile from time to time. And most importantly, <laughs> you, have to make, you have to make sure that people know who you are as a person. Okay? They, they, they understand that uh, you have a job uh, in which you have to deliver big things for the company, create value for the shareholders and for them, but they have to trust you. How do you develop those trusted partners? So, um, you know, you have employees all over the world. You can't show up and smile for them all the time, uh, but you need to be present in some way uh, and influence the way the work gets done at every level of the company. How do you think about having an impact uh, across this very global workforce? I mean, in the in the in the era of the digital. Uh, world, uh, we can be present uh, um, in many different w in many different ways. You know, I really uh, spend and invest a tremendous amount of my time feeling the pulse of the organization. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is again the result of my exposure and and uh, to uh, countries and and regions and and also. Uh, making sure people f perceive me as someone they can access at any time you know this is this is important because i mean if you put yourself in the ivory tower uh, you know you may be making very you know sound decisions and all this but you will miss the chance to connect with the organization i think connecting Connecting with the organization, connecting with the team is a, is a, is a super essential element of leadership. Um, so, yes, you know, uh, we have different tools, obviously journals. We provoke opportunities to discuss the strategy with, you know, through our uh, available digital uh, uh, media. But most importantly, again, um, each and every person of this organization know they can call on me. <laughs> I have some anecdotes on this because uh, obviously people believe that uh, access may, may be bringing a huge line outside of my office and this is obviously not the case. <laughs> you know, I, I remember when I was uh, the general manager of, of another company, of my former company in, in Spain, in my own country, um, we were in the post-integration uh, period, so Sa Sanofi has acquired Aventis, and I thought I was, I have to be very present in the organization and, and really open the doors to change the culture and establish, establish a culture of much more openness and transparency. So uh, I, my, my communication director freaked out completely when I, when I sent an email <laughs> to the whole organization and put my mobile phone at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the email. Uh, do you think that people abuse that, not at all. I, I may have received three or four calls in five years, <laughs> very important calls, simply because there were, they, I mean, they could access me through other channels, but the, the perception that uh, that gave to the organization was extremely energizing and, and positive uh, to open the door um, for them to, you know, talk to me. <laughs> And that, that is, I believe, very, very powerful and, and it's also very, very rewarding for the organization and also for me. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, um, the people that you are in communication with routinely, the executive team around you, uh, how did you think about you know, how big that group is, who's, who's on that group? Uh, I, you know, some leaders want to surround themselves, and I think you implied this earlier, with people who disagree with them to some degree, who bring different perspectives. Um, who's your executive team? Well, you know, I, I have been, uh, uh, I have stated in, in, in uh, you know, relatively often and in several media, they quote me uh, several times that one of the reasons of my success was that I always tried to have better people uh, than, than, than me uh, around me, you know? And this is extremely stimulating because, you know, if you have, cl this goes back to diversity, okay? If you surround yourself by clones of yourself, you know, I mean, what is the point? At the end, <laughs> they, will, they will say yes to me, everything is gonna be fine, we will not have any conflicts. But at the end, the fact that I can have people who are stronger than I am 
to really challenge me and stimulate me to be uh, uh, to to stretch myself and to go much further, I think it's extremely enriching. So, um, having the right team around you is is key. Uh, having this, uh, giving them the space to challenge you, even if, you know, uh, sometimes you may like it or not, but getting this feedback towards you, bottom up, is very, very important to to develop, to further develop your, your own self-awareness, which is so critical to, success, to, to develop and to succeed. Um, I lost your question. What was the question? <laughs> I, I speak about I, the team, and I, 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 don't, I don't. I don't finish. I think you answered it absolutely. Yeah, so, so. I, and um, you um, you talked a little bit about conflict too, and of course, in every leadership role, there is conflict, even in the uh, best run companies. So, uh, when you think about conflicts that have uh, come to your door as a leader, um, you know, how do you reflect on what what has gone well for you in terms of managing those conflicts, and and what you you learned that maybe you wouldn't do again? <laughs> you know, I mean, if you are not prepared to deal with conflict, uh, you shouldn't uh, apply for a for a leadership job. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Because, uh, again, <coughs> diversity is bringing conflict all the time to your lab. So this is why, I, you know, talking about diversity, uh, I always had a thought and I provoke my people a lot with this because for me diversity is not, a, is not an objective per se, it's the consequence of good leaders, of good leadership, you know, each and every good leader will will embrace diversity and it will happen it will be in their dna but obviously you know you will have to be ready to deal with conflict because this is a consequence of diversity ha there is no perfect recipe to deal with conflict at the end is really listening um, and letting them talk and most importantly pushing back to fixing it to fixing it yourself when you talk about senior leaders I mean, they should be able to fix their own conflicts. Uh, whenever there is controversy and debate, I go back to the facts, you know? And the facts is usually speak by themselves. And if they are true enterprise leaders, which to me means they are privileging the company's agenda ahead of their own agenda, the whole thing is going to be 90% of the time self solve. They will find a solution. The team will find a solution. And, and this is what I try to enable. So I try to enable an environment of open communication, uh, active listening, and uh, seeking for win-win solutions. And most importantly, when we make choices, and this goes back to your former question, I wanted to say this because it's very important. Um, I have recently gone through a major, major reorganization of my executive team. What was I looking for? I was looking for, obviously, complementary experience, um, the right talent, the right level of diversity, but most importantly, I was looking for true enterprise leaders who I know are going to be able to work together in a complementary way to take this company to the next to the new to new heights, and to me that is much more important than you know ticking all the boxes of the competencies profiles which we have and obviously we use. Uh, but having a team uh, full of talent uh, that is complementing each other and that e that will be able to work collaboratively is what I believe any organization needs to succeed. Thank you, and I want to slip in a question that is from me. Uh, and uh, we we heard that you're the first woman to head a top twenty five pharmaceutical company, uh, and uh, I am so interested in your perspective from where you sit. What what will it take to diversify by gender, race, uh, um, other aspects of identity, the C suite uh, in global business? Uh, do, do you see you know a gradual shift? Are are there um, major structural changes that are needed to really bring diversity to the top of these companies? 
I think we have made a small progress, but there are certainly major barriers to, uh, to helping women to, uh, to, uh, to reach to the top. Uh, I'm not so much in favor, or I wasn't, let's put it that way, I wasn't so much in favor of, of positive discrimination because in a way it's a trap if you don't use it in the right way. Obviously, uh, having a specific uh, regulation and, and some positive discrimination is helping us improve, even if slowly, uh, mainly on boards and all these kind of things. You know, I believe on, on, on female leadership, uh, we haven't gone far enough and we will require major, uh, not on the company, uh, at the company level, but at the end, you know, most of the problems that we have are, in a way, social barriers, you know, stereotypes. We are still considered, this may not be the case in this country, but let me tell you, uh, in the countries in which I'm coming from, and even in the country in which we are living today, uh, female who are not taken care of the family are not always well perceived. And, you know, does it mean that a professional uh, woman like any of us uh, is not taking care of the family, obviously not. I mean, we need a different kind of organization. Uh, we need to break certain paradigms, but not each and every woman is ready to, to, to act with uh, that determination and, and to feel confident that, you know, uh, when your mother-in-law is challenging you because you are not home on a Sunday night, it's totally fine, you know. <laughs> I mean, you are not. It's not. You are not making any harm because you have to travel on a Sunday. You know. You have to. I, I mean, I have two daughters, and uh, both of them. One is 24, the other one is 20. Uh, this never stopped my career, and I didn't. I never felt I was failing then. You know. Now, when I look at this with uh, with tremendous distance you know, with, uh, with uh, many years uh, of experience behind me, I, I believe that I was the one who missed certain things. And I, this is probably what I would change if I have to start again. But those barriers are super important for females. And, mm -hmm. and this is not going to be changed in a day. This is not going to be changed only by legislation. I mean, we need to actually welcome male to take care of the family, you know? This is exactly what we need to do. We need to welcome them, we need to invite them, we need to make sure male would be absolutely happy to, 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 to help us do that. I cannot complain, you know? My husband has been uh, making major sacrifice to help me get where I am, but this is not the case for to many females. I consider this to be a major, major, major hurdle. So we have to really continue to convince women to act with determination, to shape their careers beyond social myths. And obviously, we have to push legislators to help us do that as well. It's going to be a longer term topic, I believe. Th thank you so much for um, all those wise words. And, you, you know, the, I think the thing that stood out for me most is uh, the sense that what has been important for you has been uh, the ability to really listen and, uh, and appreciate the, uh, the role of diversity in, um, in any enterprise uh, in accomplishing uh, what you have as a, as a leader and, uh, and in throwing yourself into the deep end. Uh, so thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you here today. And I just wanna let everybody know that the next Voices in Leadership uh, uh, activity will be on February 29th with Gina McCarthy of the US EPA. So we look forward to seeing you all here again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Melody.